Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Uh, we're going to give everybody a minute or two here to get into the room and then we'll get started. All right. It looks like our numbers are starting to slow down, so I'll assume everyone's in. Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Elena Crete. I work with the Sustainable Development Solutions Network, or SDSN. Um, we're here today to discuss um, a few highlights from America's Zero Carbon Action Plan, which was recently released by SDSN USA. Um, for today's session, we're going to specifically focus on the legislative and administrative framework that's put forward in the report and also talk about what that means for federal, state, and city agencies. Um, the Zero Carbon Action Plan was developed over the last year by the Zero Carbon Consortium, which is made up of nearly 100 researchers from academic institutions across the United States. Uh, the primary mandate of the project was to articulate a detailed policy pathway to help the U.S. reach net zero carbon by mid-century in line with the Paris Agreement. Um, the report is basically anchored in an intensive modeling exercise, which was done by Evolved Energy Research. Um, they used a backcasting model to determine the potential least cost pathway to decarbonize the most emissions intensive industries in the U.S. So their least cost pathway to the transition or their central case in the model um, is what serves as the basis for the rest of the report. So today we're gonna hear from three speakers. Um, first, we'll have John Dernbach from the Widener University Commonwealth Law School and Michael Gerard from Columbia Law School uh, who will each discuss the federal perspective and the key recommendations from the report. Then we're going to turn to Kit Kennedy, the Senior Director of the Climate and Energy Program at NRDC, who's going to give us the state and city perspective um, and the different sectoral tools at that scale to implement and support the transition. Um, before we begin, I'd just like to let everyone know this webinar is being recorded. Uh, both the recording and the PowerPoint that you see today will be available later today on the ZCAP website, where you can also download the report. So we'll put that link in the chat shortly, uh, so you can visit that afterwards and also share with your networks. Um, and then finally, just mentioning, we're gonna have a Q&A session at the end of this webinar. Um, we want to hear from you, answer your questions, dig into the material. So please, as our speakers are presenting, feel free to add your questions into the Q&A box on the Zoom platform. And then I'll help to moderate um, that session towards the end. Uh, so without further ado, I see John and Michael have joined us. Uh, please feel free to get us started. All right, well, thank you so much. <clears throat> thank you so much, Elena. Uh, the job that Michael and I have today is to talk about the federal legislative and administrative framework part of the ZCAP report. Uh, and I think as a lot of the folks who are listening today know, uh, Michael and I uh, edited a book that was published last year by the Environmental Law Institute called Legal Pathways to Deep Decarbonization in the United States. It was an edited volume. It had about 60 contributing authors and it made way over a thousand recommendations at the federal, state and local level. What Michael and I did in preparing this part of the ZCAP report is to build on uh, the recommendations that we had in that particular book, but also to, to include recommendations that came from other authors. Uh, next slide, please. So, a framing device for this, as Elena alluded to, are four pillars of deep decarbonization that were in the technical work that was done uh, as a predicate for this report. And it's worthwhile uh, uh, outlining those at least briefly. As a starting point, the idea behind electricity decarbonization, the first pillar, is to move pretty much all electricity over to renewables. That looks like the most cost-effective approach at this point. The idea behind energy efficiency and conservation uh, partly is to save money, uh, partly to create jobs, but also 
Uh, this is to reduce the amount of new renewable electricity that needs to be generated. The third pillar, electrification of transportation and buildings, means pretty much moving uh, buildings and, and uh, vehicles uh, over to electricity, perhaps some hydrogen, but mostly over to electricity. Um, and getting that done uh, as close as possible, at least, to getting that done by 2050. And then finally, carbon capture. Uh, the point being that getting to negative emissions may not be enough. We also need to figure out ways of pulling carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. I should add that significantly reducing emissions of other non-carbon dioxide pollutants uh, is an important addendum or addition to the four pillars. Next slide. So what we've done, Michael and I, is, uh, on, is divided the recommendations at the federal level into two parts, recommendations for the administration and recommendations for Congress. And among those recommendations, we've divided, maybe made a second division, and that is cross-cutting recommendations that apply across all four pillars, uh, and then recommendations that apply to specific pillars. Michael is going to be telling you about cross-cutting recommendations for both the administration and for Congress. And I'm going to be talking to you about uh, uh, the recommendations for each of the pillars, both for the administration and for Congress. Because of the way the Senate races came out, it looks like the most appropriate way to do this is to begin with the administration. And that's how we're going to proceed. Michael? Thank you. Next slide, please. Um, so starting with the cross-cutting recommendations of what the new administration will be able to do and what we're recommending. Uh, we're recommending that President Biden establish a White House office on climate change uh, that would uh, coordinate all of these uh, actions across all levels of government. And um, if Congress fails to act, and it looks like Congress will probably fail to act, um, uh, the president uh, should use all lawful means within his executive authority to drive uh, a decarbonization. Now, during the campaign, um, uh, former Vice President Biden uh, said he wanted to achieve net zero emissions from the US by 2050 and zero carbon electricity by 2035. So what we're suggesting is entirely consistent with the uh, pledges made by, uh, by now President-elect Biden. Next slide. Um, so in uh, along the lines of, of engaging the entire federal government, we suggest that each of the relevant agencies uh, uh, come up with uh, specific timelines and goals for how they are going to get to these goals of zero carbon electricity in 2035 and net zero emissions by 2050. Uh, just having the goals out there in a distant year is not, is not sufficient, but, uh, but each agency should come up with specific plans and interim targets so everybody can keep uh, uh, a track of it. And each agency should use the powers that it has under existing statutory authority to the fullest extent to achieve these objectives. Next slide. Uh, one of the things that, uh, that should be done and, and can be done with, with an existing statutory authority is to revise the social cost of carbon, which is a figure that, that, that calculates what the damages that are, that are done by uh, uh, marginal emissions of, of carbon, uh, come up with a figure that is consistent with the objective uh, of 1.5 degrees centigrade increase above pre-industrial conditions, as the IPCC has said we really uh, uh, need to do. And this number should then feed into the, the development of regulations, the conduct of cost benefit analysis, procurement subsidies, carbon taxes, if we have that, and other policies. Next slide. Um, the, the Trump administration revoked a whole series of uh, regulations and guidance documents. Uh, the executive orders uh, encouraging fossil fuel emissions can be revoked with the stroke of a pen. The uh, regulations that went through the full notice and comment process will have to go back through that process. That'll take a while, uh, but the Biden administration uh, should, and I think will uh, undertake this exercise to put back the regulations that had been adopted by the Obama administration and go beyond that. 
Um, the clean power plan um, of the Obama administration is particularly vulnerable to legal challenge. It was stayed by the Supreme Court in February of 2016. And the Supreme Court's composition now is, if anything, likely to be more hostile. So um, we're not suggesting that the clean power plan be uh, put back in precisely its former form, but there are other authorities under the Clean Air Act that can be used. Next slide. Uh, the, the federal government is far and away the largest purchaser of goods and services in the United States. It can set an example and make markets by insisting that its procurement uh, be of low emission and negative emission building materials and products and services. Next slide. The federal government uh, has massive land holdings, mostly managed by the uh, Bureau of Land Management. And uh, uh, shortly before President Obama left office, he instituted a moratorium on leasing of federal lands for, uh, for coal mining. We think that should be, uh, and then the, uh, Trump uh, revoked that. We think that should be put back in place and serious thought should be given to imposing a moratorium on leasing of federal lands onshore and offshore uh, for uh, oil and gas uh, uh, extraction and uh, consider a moratorium on construction of other fossil fuel infrastructure to the extent that's within federal power. Next slide. Um, there is bipartisan consensus on uh, a lot more research and development being uh, needed on uh, greenhouse gas uh, producing technologies and energy efficiency and carbon capture with removal technology. So that should certainly go forward. Next slide. Um, we also um, think that the federal government should uh, design and implement policies to uh, exploit the uh, what behaviors, behavioral science tells us about how household emissions can be uh, reduced. Uh, domestic and international private sector action should be uh, uh, should be leveraged and and given incentives. And throughout all of this. Uh, the government uh, should and the Biden administration certainly plans to ensure that people of color and low income communities are protected, that there's a just transition for those individuals and communities that depend on the carbon economy, and that the co-benefits such as re reductions in conventional air pollutants be, uh, be maximized. Next slide. Uh, finally, uh, uh, of course, uh, President Biden has said that on the first day, the US is going to rejoin the Paris uh, Climate Agreement. The government will then have to come up with its next nationally determined contribution, its pledges as part of the uh, Paris uh, Climate Agreement. The federal government should also implement uh, the Kigali Amendment, which called for reductions in the emissions of hydrofluorocarbons. And overall, the US should uh, reestablish its foreign policy leadership in the climate space. Next slide. Now I'm going to turn it back to John, who's going to talk about uh, some of the recommended actions for the administration that are key to particular pillars. Well, thank you, Michael. Uh, a starting point here uh, is, is when we talked about decarbonizing electricity, the first pillar was to move pretty much all electricity generation over to renewables. And consistent with that, uh, our thinking is, is that there needs to be a large scale program uh, for, for, for scaling up renewables, uh, wind, uh, shore and onshore, uh, utility scale solar, rooftop solar, uh, and uh, all the rest of it, including trans transmission and storage. Um, uh, by way of background, uh, Michael prepared an excellent chapter in our Legal Pathways book on this exact point, uh, uh, documenting and explaining the need to, 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 to advance this kind of a program and what that program would look like. Part of what that program is going to need to look like um, is making sure that the National Environmental Policy Act and the Endangered Species Act processes uh, are used in a way that is consistent with the purpose of those statutes uh, but not to unduly delay uh, the, the development of, of, of these particular kinds of projects. Next slide, please. So 
An important slice of reality here is what publicly traded corporations do. There's a recent report by the Federal Reserve um, indicating, uh, uh, actually recognizing uh, that, that uh, there's all sorts of risks involved in managing and operating publicly traded corporations that need to be disclosed. And we think the Securities and Exchange Commission should uh, uh, in, play a larger role uh, in, in making that happen. The Obama administration began to do that, uh, but the Trump administration pulled back from that. And so I think our, 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 our recommendation would be uh, to move ahead with, with greater and more specific disclosure. Next slide, please. So one of the other federal agencies that's been playing a large role in, uh, uh, in the transition to a clean energy economy is an agency that a lot of folks have not heard about, which is the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, um, which has enormous responsibility for uh, uh, interstate uh, um, distribution and transmission of, of, of energy. Uh, and what has been happening in the last several years is that FERC has been playing a role that is that is actually to, to some degree uh, uh, protecting uh, uh, fossil fuels and and um, in discouraging renewables, and we think that ought to change. Uh, we also think that the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission should approve uh, uh, applications by state public utility commissions and other organizations for carbon adders, which is a way of of, 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 of is consistent with the social cost of carbon, uh, which would have the effect of increasing on the wholesale electric on the wholesale markets the price of fossil fuels, and helping move toward renewable electricity. Next slide, please. The second pillar is energy efficiency and conservation. Uh, one of the things that we talked about um, quite a lot was the 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 fact that the Trump administration has been um, moving backwards in uh, on, on energy. If I've been mute this whole time? Nope, no. you, just, you just cut out for a second. We can hear you, go ahead. Oh, okay. Um, so one of the things that the, the, the Obama administration was pretty aggressive about under energy efficiency and conservation is finalizing a great number of rules for uh, uh, appliances uh, and uh, energy efficiency devices at uh, in the, sort of the residential and commercial level, that slowed down, even stopped and reversed to some degree under Trump. And what we're thinking is, is that that needs to start again um, in an aggressive way. But that in addition to that, for purposes of energy efficiency and conservation, uh, we need a, a really aggressive program for reducing energy use in federal buildings. Uh, that could play a really important leadership role federal government needs to move federal funds away from funding new highway construction uh, and, and toward alternatives to that, uh, modify road pricing in the process, um, and, and subsidize rural on-demand transit service for small cities and denser rural areas. We also think an interesting opportunity here would be creating a certification program for carbon neutral food products. Next slide, please. So on electrification of transportation and buildings, um, what we're thinking here is uh, uh, actually starts with a reversal of a lot of the administration policies uh, on, on, on motor vehicles um, and tightening greenhouse gas standards and fuel economy standards uh, with the idea of phasing out combustion, internal combustion engines altogether and substituting um, electric cars. Uh, we, ought, we think that a parallel process ought to occur uh, with heavy duty vehicles using hydrogen and low carbon biofuels as well as electrification. Um, and we think a partnership uh, 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 on developing infrastructure for electric vehicle part charging stations is gonna be a really, really important slice of reality. Uh, where I live and elsewhere, um, the use of electric vehicles is held back um, by not having that kind of infrastructure program. Um, and then finally using procurement um, the federal government should prioritize biofuels use for certain uses that are really harder uh, for, for, to, to, to substitute, like long haul trucks, aviation and shipping, um, and move toward more sustainable production of biofuels. Next slide, please. Um, finally, on carbon capture, um, carbon capture is different than renewables in the following sense. 
we can move and, and should move in a very strong way toward, toward pillar one, uh, de decarbonizing electricity over the next 10 years. We've got the technologies to do that. Prices are coming down. It makes sense. And there's a lot of momentum for that. But in carbon capture, there's all sorts of technologies out there that are probably going to be really, really effective um, a couple of decades from now, but which we haven't even invented yet, probably haven't even thought through. Um, and what we really need to do is, is, is employ a very aggressive program of incentives, research and development, procurement mandates, regulatory requirements and the like to move those technologies ahead. And beyond that, we need to think about doing something similar to that with respect to, 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 to agriculture and crop insurance, because there's lots of opportunities to do carbon capture in soil. And if we oriented a lot of the USDA and other programs, US Department of Agriculture and other programs toward that, we could actually make quite a lot of progress on carbon capture. Um, and I'll just plug once again, the agriculture chapter in our Legal Pathways book, which laid out a lot of this in even greater detail. Um, next slide, please. So the final point that I'll make here is this was the, the, the sort of the plus, if you will, the, in a sense, the fifth uh, uh, pillar of de deep decarbonization um, is looking at non-carbon dioxide pollutants, methane, nitrous oxide, fluorinated compounds, and black carbon. A lot of these are subject to regulation by, by EPA. Um, and, and we think that, that a lot of that, re and, and including uh, regulation of oil and gas wells, and we think a lot of that regulation ought to be strengthened uh, 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 in, 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 and uh, made even more ambitious uh, as we look down the road. A lot of these, uh, every single one of these has a greater greenhouse gas impact, molecule for molecule, pound for pound than carbon dioxide, and they deserve serious attention. Next slide, please. So the next thing we, we did is we, we, we had a great many recommendations uh, uh, in, in our chapter in this report on um, for Congress. And uh, as, as we indicated before, Michael is gonna take the cross cutting recommendations uh, and I'm going to look at the pillar by pillar recommendations. Uh, thanks, John. Now the next slide. So it, it is not currently looking positive that Congress uh, is going to be constituted such that it will do these things we're gonna talk about, but we're gonna go through what our uh, thoughts were anyway. Um, uh, we think Congress should adopt a zero carbon action plan that commits the nation to these uh, binding reductions and establish intermediate and sector specific emissions reductions targets. Next slide. Um, this uh, would require Congress to ask Congress to require the administration to uh, create an enforceable national plan uh, to move us in this direction and require each administration to update the plan every two years and report to Congress annually on, on how it's doing and calling for various other reports to Congress. Next slide. Um, we are looking, for, we were recommending a tripling of the funding for deep decarbonization, research and development, demonstration and deployment. Uh, this uh, tripling is a figure recommended by a report recently produced by uh, Columbia Center for Global Energy Policy. We think that some form of carbon tax uh, or pricing, some form of carbon pricing would be very helpful. It's not essential but it would help uh, move uh, many things out. It could be a carbon tax, it could be cap and trade, fuel pricing subsidies. There are a number of different ways that it could be done, but to make sure that the externalities are internalized, that there are price signals throughout the economy, throughout supply chains to encourage low carbon uh, activities. Uh, but this probably requires Congress to, uh, to act. Uh, we think that uh, Congress uh, should launch innovative green financing mechanisms. Now, there are a number of existing authorities for financing mechanisms, those should be used, but uh, Congress, uh, uh, we think should uh, create more of them uh, and should adopt the Masters Limited uh, Partnership Parity Act to allow renewables to participate in these tax advantage kinds of transactions. Next slide. Um, the, uh, uh, Fossil fuel subsidies should be eliminated. They should be taken out of the tax code. Next slide. Um, and then, uh, so, so these are the cross-cutting um, initiatives that we talked about. Uh, 
And now I'm gonna turn it back to John to talk about the key recommendations that are key to specific pillars. Right, well, thank you, Michael. So um, for decarbonizing electricity, there are a couple of things that would help a great deal. Um, the National Clean Energy Standard probably emerged at the top of our list as we went through this process uh, to develop the Zero Carbon Action Plan. Um, and the idea would be uh, to, to, uh, to, to it's something like a renewable portfolio standard, although at a national level, and it doesn't just focus on renewable um, electricity. Um, and basically what it, it, there are different forms of it, but the idea is to move toward higher and higher percentages of clean electricity um, uh, as we go through decade by decade. Um, the second part of this is mandate the phasing out of all coal-fired power plants. Um, and, um, um, and, and of course, make adequate provision for displaced workers. Uh, part of the, uh, excuse, let's go back to, yeah, thank you. The, the, uh, the one other thing here um, is a low carbon fuel standard or a clean fuel standard for liquid fuels uh, for transportation. Um, and that's, that's, a, that's another thing that if, if Congress could do these things, um, that would, all of these things would help us uh, uh, move much more quickly and effectively toward decarbonizing electricity. Second, next slide, please. So with respect to energy efficiency and conservation, our thought process was to strengthen the Energy Policy and Conservation Act. This is the statute that gives the Department of Energy authority uh, to establish uh, 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 energy efficiency standards for all sorts of new products. Um, and our thought was that the uh, department ought to have more authority to do that, that the efficiency metrics ought not to be just energy use, um, um, but also a reduction in carbon use, if we can make that happen. Um, and to give the Department of Energy binding deadlines for adopting and strengthening these standards. Um, all things that are necessary to ensure that over, as we go from administration to administration, there's less of the back and forth that we've seen um, uh, the start stop issue that we've seen with energy efficiency standards over the last couple of decades and more continuity. Um, and I think a federal, when we think that a federal requirement that new buildings generally be fossil fuel uh, free uh, and meet aggressive standards of energy efficiency and carbon use reduction by 2025 uh, coming from Congress, that would be a very valuable thing. Next slide, please. So in terms of electrification of transportation and uh, 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 buildings, we had a number of recommendations uh, and I'm just share with you two of these. Uh, one is prioritizing biofuels use uh, for, for long haul trucks, aviation and shipping. These are the more specialized uses that I alluded to earlier. A lot of the technical analysis that was done, the, the building block for this report uh, was based on the premise that the, the, the use of uh, um, ethanol uh, for light duty vehicles is probably not the best use of, 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 of ethanol. Uh, there's a limited amount of ethanol that you can produce in the first place. And if you're gonna only be able to produce a small amount of it and if producing it sustainably is gonna be an issue, better to prioritize it for specialized uses like these. The other thing is, what do you do about decarbonizing buildings? And the thought that we had uh, was having Congress direct the adoption of a model national energy code for buildings. Uh, that could then be used by the states. Next slide, please. Um, with respect to carbon capture, um, two thoughts. Both of these are about um, looking ahead. Uh, one of them is about scaling up research and development and demonstration deployment for carbon capture and negative emissions technologies. And in having sort of a national goal of uh, bringing these uh, technologies to scale at much lower costs as soon as possible. Similarly, we think Congress ought to mandate a strategy to achieve national forest, national forest, national reforestation um, uh, to to a, a, a particular percentage uh, or a particular number of acres by by 2050. And we think that kind of a goal and the uh, uh, the, the the sort of work that would go with that uh, would go a long way toward. Uh, um, uh, capturing carbon from, from, from forests. I think that's the end of our presentation. If you need to contact us, that here's our contact information and uh, we'll take questions uh, at the conclusion of the, uh, the formal presentations. So I'll turn it back over to, I think, Kit. 
Yeah, Kit, go ahead and turn your camera on and join us and uh, continue on from the state and city perspective. Great. Well, thanks so much uh, for including me in this discussion, uh, Elena. And uh, I'm not an author of the Zero Carbon Action Plan, but I worked with Mike and John on their deep decarbonization uh, treatise, which I highly recommend. It wrote the energy efficiency recommendations uh, it, in, in that book, uh, which also covers state and local policy in, in, in great detail. So I wanted to kind of bring together uh, the, I, the recommendations from the ZCAP plan, from uh, Mike and John's treatise, and uh, my own work to talk about how states and cities uh, can contribute to the Zero Carbon Action Plan. Next slide. So what's the role of states and cities in, in decarbonization? And, uh, and uh, the big question uh, at, at this moment is, does the role of states and cities change when we have a climate champion uh, president? In my view, states and cities are important drivers of climate and clean energy progress. Uh, and that remains true uh, regardless of who is president, what type of administration we have. States regulate in-state power generation and electricity distribution uh, under, under, our, uh, under our constitutional approach. Uh, states regulate electric and gas utilities and engage in energy planning. States have broad authority to regulate pollution, including uh, greenhouse uh, gas pollution. And uh, cities have many important functions too. They drive demand for clean energy, they're incubators for innovation, and cities can take, in many instances, not all, the same actions uh, that, that states can take to promote climate and clean energy progress. Um, and states and cities are still important, even under a, a climate-friendly federal administration, because of the inherent powers that states and cities have. And indeed, under a climate-friendly administration, states and cities take on a, a, a broader role in many respects as they are in charge with implementing federal policy. So for instance, if the Biden administration produces a new version of the Clean Power Plan, uh, which puts, uh, uh, which under the Obama administration put uh, carbon limits on existing and new power plants, states would be in charge of state implementation plans to implement that uh, set of regulations to make it real in their states. Cities would ha also have a role. Uh, similarly, if we do see uh, in this age of COVID stimulus funds aimed at economic uh, and health recovery, states and cities will have an important role uh, in the distribution and allocation of those funds. It is also important to recognize that there are limits on state and city authority and ability to act. Uh, the federal government can, under some circumstances, preempt state action. So we've seen that play out with the Trump administration uh, attempting to uh, withdraw the, uh, the right which California has had for decades uh, to issue its own stronger clean car standards. Uh, that, that's being challenged now in the courts, but that's, uh, that's a, a very strong attempt by the current administration uh, to preempt state climate action. Uh, states who are unfriendly to climate progress can sometimes preempt city action as well. So uh, whether a city can adopt a stretch energy efficiency code, which will promote energy efficiency and building electrification, depends on the authority in many instances given to it by the state. Uh, so if, if, uh, if you have a climate champion city in a non-progressive, uh, non-climate activist state, that can pose problems. Uh, there are limits on state and city resources, of course, particularly uh, during the time of COVID. And uh, there are limits simply on, on geographic and jurisdictional reach. The federal government uh, can, through an act of Congress, through an executive order, through a regulation, uh, enact policies that touch and affect and require action by every state in the union. When we go state by state or city by city, uh, it's a potentially a slower form of progress. Next slide, please. 
So I want to touch uh, in my in brief time on a couple of areas, state and city cross-cutting climate action, state and city energy efficiency action, state and city renewable energy policy, and state and city transportation electrification and, and building electrification. So in terms of cross-cutting climate action, uh, states have all sorts of tools that they can use, and we've seen states use them uh, particularly over the last four years. A number of states have adopted ambitious climate legislation and mandates. Uh, one example is the New York Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act uh, passed last year, which uh, sets a net zero by 2050 uh, uh, climate goal for New York State and a number of very ambitious uh, renewable energy clean electricity uh, goals and various sub mandates for things like solar, uh, offshore wind, storage and energy efficiency. And the CLCPA also includes important equity provisions, uh, including that 35 to 40% of the benefits from New York's climate and clean energy programs have to go to disadvantaged communities. There's also California's uh, AB 32, which was the first uh, economy-wide carbon cap uh, adopted by a state, which also includes equity and a complementary uh, local air pollution provisions. We've also seen states uh, act on climate via executive orders. Uh, just this fall, Michigan Governor Whitmer issued an executive order calling for Michigan to reach net zero greenhouse gas emissions economy-wide by 2050. We also see states work together in a collaborative way uh, on uh, uh, carbon ambition. So here in the East, uh, we have the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, 10 Eastern states working together uh, and individually to set a cap on carbon that will decline that declines over time. It's been a very successful program over the last uh, decade or so that it's been in place. Uh, power plant carbon emissions have been cut almost in half. Uh, and there have been a multitude of co benefits, uh, de decreases in other forms of air pollution, job creation. Uh, and investments in energy efficiency uh, and, and renewables. Uh, Virginia will join the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative uh, in January of 2021, and Pennsylvania is poised to join the initiative in, uh, uh, later in 2021. Um, and then we also see state collective action uh, of other sorts also. Uh, 25 or so states have joined the U.S. Climate Alliance, and these are bipartisan uh, governors who have joined, uh, Republicans and Democrats. And the U.S. Climate Alliance bring those states brings those states together uh, to ensure that those states are staying on track to meeting their portion uh, of the Paris Climate Accord. Uh, during a time when, of course, the uh, the federal government under the Trump administration uh, stepped back from that agreement. Cities can take uh, many parallel actions. Uh, many cities uh, have climate plans, climate action plans. Uh, New York City is one. Cities also work together collectively in a very ambitious way. So there's the, the C40 uh, city coalition uh, here in the US cities have banded together uh, through the We're Still In initiative, whereby cities uh, pledge to meet their portion of uh, Paris Accord goals. And then there's the American Cities Climate Challenge, uh, initiated by Bloomberg Philanthropies, which NRDC and other groups are a part of, uh, whereby 25 of the largest uh, uh, American cities uh, are pledging to certain actions to reduce climate emissions. Cities also have regulatory power, as I noted in the last slide, to adopt greenhouse gas uh, pollution mandates. Uh, here in New York, uh, there's the New York City Local Law 97, the Climate Mobilization Act, which sets a, a, a cap on greenhouse gas emissions from large buildings, um, which declines uh, over time. 
uh, and other cities are, are taking similar actions as well. And importantly, uh, some cities have municipal utilities, regulate their own utilities, uh, and, and cities can take climate action in that way as well. Next slide, please. On energy efficiency, there are a number of important tools uh, that, that many, many states are using and, and, uh, and, and many more uh, should be using. So an energy efficiency portfolio tool is a policy tool uh, somewhat similar to a renewable portfolio standard where states commit as a mandate to, uh, to reaching a certain level of energy efficiency savings um, per year. Uh, and uh, uh, NRDC's recommendation is that uh, each state adopt an energy efficiency portfolio standard uh, of at least 2.5% energy efficiency savings um, per year. Uh, there are state energy efficiency standards, which are the state version uh, of the policy tool, which I think John described in the last slides. We're not preempted by, uh, by the Energy Policy and Conservation Act. States can set efficiency standards uh, for products and appliance, appliances uh, sold within their boundaries. And California uh, has been a leader in, in that regard. Uh, for instance, both California and Nevada have a special exemption from preemption under EPCA and have set stronger uh, light bulb efficiency standards uh, than, than mandated by the federal government, which has been important as the Trump administration has sought to roll back those standards. States can also use various tools to encourage energy efficiency financing, including green banks and property assessed clean energy financing, um, which uh, allows homeowners uh, to essentially finance energy efficiency improvements uh, via their, uh, their municipal tax bills. Um, utility commission policy is, is super important in terms of uh, regulating energy efficiency. Uh, so states can uh, get at good energy efficiency outcomes through individual utility rate cases and through integrated resource planning uh, for, for those states with vertically integrated utilities. And finally, uh, states uh, have the power to set building energy efficiency codes um, uh, for buildings within their jurisdiction, and that's an important driver of energy efficiency. Cities have um, many uh, means of incenting and requiring energy efficiency also. I mentioned uh, New York City's uh, energy efficiency and greenhouse gas mandate for existing buildings. Uh, DC has a similar mandate. Many cities are, are adopting benchmarking and retrofitting or building energy performance ordinances. St. Louis, uh, for instance, uh, adopted uh, a very strong building energy performance uh, ordinance this fall. Where allowed by state law, uh, cities can adopt stretch energy efficiency codes, um, which go beyond the state minimum, and that's a very important tool also. And cities have uh, energy efficiency financing tools um, that, that they can use as well. Uh, many cities as well as states have green banks, and cities can also, of course, use PACE financing tools. Next slide. Building electrification is a fascinating uh, area of new focus as we do these deep decarbonization uh, analyses as, as uh, uh, climate advocates have been doing over the last few years. It's become uh, crystal clear, clear that not only do we need to promote energy efficiency in our buildings, but we need to get rid of uh, fossil fuel uses within our buildings for heating, cooling, hot water, and, and cooking. Uh, and so building electrification um, is, is really a, a new field um, where cities are leading the way and um, states are, are also uh, striving um, to be leaders. 
Uh, so it's very important when we set policy here that building electrification policies be closely aligned with energy efficiency policies so that when we look at our existing buildings and new buildings, we're both making them as energy efficient as possible and we're electrifying them. The two go hand in hand. Uh, by, by improving the energy efficiency of a building shell, we're bringing down the cost of, uh, uh, of electrification, which is a, a really important factor. We also have to align uh, electrification policy with low income protection and benefit and housing policy. Uh, we wanna make sure that uh, low income communities uh, can benefit from building electrification and that they aren't harmed uh, by it in the sense that we don't want improvements in our buildings to cause rent increases that can be passed on to tenants and low income tenants. Um, an important tool that states have uh, uh, to promote building electrification is market transformation and incentive policies. Because we're sort of at the beginning of the building electrification movement, um, we need to bring down the cost of uh, electric technologies like heat pumps. Um, and currently heat pumps only have a very small percentage uh, of the heating and cooling market. We have to bring up that percentage rapidly. There are also mandates on building electrification that, uh, that many states uh, are considering. So for instance, in California, the California Energy uh, Commission, which sets uh, efficiency codes for the state, uh, is considering an all-electric building code uh, beginning potentially as uh, uh, you know, within the next few years. States have financing tools which are important to promote uh, building electrification. And as with energy efficiency, utility commission uh, policy is really important, including gas and electric rate cases and future of gas proceedings, which look at um, uh, questions like how do we transition off gas for our buildings and altogether, how to handle stranded assets, uh, how to handle just transition issues for communities and workers. Uh, New York has, has such a proceeding uh, underway. Uh, states can fund or support electrification via, via use of utility system benefit funds. Importantly, states can set outdoor and indoor air pollution standards to address the health risks of gas and to expedite uh, the transition uh, from gas to electric technologies. And states have the ability to use their permitting authority to say no to extensions uh, of gas infrastructure, new gas infrastructure projects that uh, would, would tend to extend the life of, of, of gas in a particular state. Um, cities, as I mentioned, have really been at the forefront in driving the building electrification um, uh, movement. San, uh, San Jose and many, many other uh, California cities have adopted all electric building codes. Just the other day, San Francisco uh, adopted a, a, a similar uh, all electric uh, building code. Cities can use land use and affordable housing policy uh, to help guide the transition from gas to electric technologies. Cities have financing tools. Uh, the ZCAP report, for instance, mentions the Portland, the Portland Clean Energy Fund as, as one such uh, uh, financing tool that cities can use. And cities also uh, can, uh, sometimes have municipal gas utilities, which they uh, directly or indirectly control, for instance, uh, the Philadelphia Gas Works in Philadelphia. Cities can also, uh, in many instances, set air pollution standards to address the health uh, uh, and air quality risks of gas uh, and can also use permitting authority with respect to gas infrastructure. Next slide, please. Uh, when it comes to clean transportation, cities and states also have a wide variety of tools. And clean, transformation, clean, clean transportation encompasses a variety of types of actions. It's really important to electrify uh, transportation in order to meet uh, US climate goals. And it's also important to bring down uh, vehicle miles tra uh, traveled and to Im improve uh, clean mobility options, and of course, to improve public transportation, which is uh, absolutely crucial, more crucial 
now than ever uh, in the light of COVID. So states uh, have, have many policy tools here, many relate to the federal policy tools, which Mike and John mentioned. There's the California Clean Car Standards, uh, which a growing number of other states have expressed, have either adopted or expressed uh, interest in adopting. Uh, there are zero emission vehicle mandates, which states can adopt. California has just issued a really groundbreaking advanced clean trucks rule, which will uh, really require elect all electric uh, heavy duty trucks by 2050 with interim um, milestones. And 15 states have signed a memorandum of understanding organized by NESCOM uh, on clean trucks, which by which states uh, commit to exploring similar options within their states. Utility commission policy can be used to support uh, electric vehicle infrastructure. We see that happening in individual utility rate cases and in uh, more generic uh, EV infrastructure proceedings at utility commissions. And then there are ca carbon caps for transportation, which uh, states have adopted or are examining. I mentioned uh, California's AB 32 adopted uh, uh, almost a decade ago now, which sets an economy-wide cap on greenhouse gas pollution, including transportation. And here in the East, 12 states plus Washington, D.C. are engaged in an effort called the Cl Transportation and Climate Initiative, which is looking to um, set a cap on uh, greenhouse gas emissions from the transportation sector with some uh, important equity provisions in mind. Low income electric vehicle uh, programs are also really, really important so that we can ensure that uh, low income uh, communities and communities of color have access uh, to electric vehicles. And then states, of course, play an important role on public transportation uh, policy, uh, decreasing vehicle miles traveled, and improving clean mobility options um, like biking, walking, uh, et cetera. And cities play an important role in this also, in, in really in all of the above. Uh, cities can encourage uh, electric vehicles in a variety of ways, including through supporting uh, EV infrastructure, charging stations, and the like. Cities can use land use policy, which is an inherently local function, to encourage housing near transit. Uh, cities can uh, adopt congestion pricing uh, to bring down uh, greenhouse gas pollution from driving. London, of course, has done that. New York City has done that, although it is uh, not yet in place. Uh, and, and cities have a, a variety of tools to reduce VMT and improve clean mobility options. And we see that happening in many of the American cities, uh, climate challenge cities. Next slide, please. Ah, uh, I, I seem to have omitted, uh, I may have omitted a slide on uh, renewables. Can you just quickly, uh, Elena, uh, go back through the slides. If I've omitted it, I can just uh, uh, go through it quickly. Just go back through the slides quickly, Elena. Sorry. Okay. Uh, my apologies. I meant to include a slide on renewables. Um, and when it comes to renewables, both states and cities uh, also have important roles. Uh, the most important state policy to promote renewables is the Renewable Portfolio Standard, which about 30 states uh, have now uh, adopted. And renewable portfolio standards um, require that certain percentages of electricity generated within that state come from, uh, uh, come from RPSs. Uh, and states can also use financing, set mandates for um, uh, specific renewable energy technologies, and cities have a variety of tools that they can use also. So since we're running out of time, I'll leave it at that, but happy to answer any questions. 
Wonderful. Thank you, Kit. Um, if you didn't author our report, you must have at least skimmed through it because a lot of the examples you provided are definitely in our state and city chapter. So I encourage others to go check them out there as well. And lots of case studies of all of this being done in practice and how and what were the enabling factors. Um, we do still uh, have a couple questions here um, and a couple minutes left. So we'll just jump right into it. Um, starting with uh, Rita Clement asked um, about San Diego is currently negotiating a franchise agreement and also setting up a San Diego Community Power um, um, Community Association to distribute electricity. Uh, what's your opinion on the municipal framework versus the community choice energy plans? I, can't, I think that's to you. Yes. Uh, yeah, there's, there's a lot of interesting experimentation going on with um, uh, community choice aggregation. Uh, a, a ballot initiative uh, uh, passed on that in Ohio just in the last election. Um, and I think, uh, you know, there are many, many different ways uh, of getting that clean electricity. And so cities should, con should consider all of them. I'm not sure one model is, is uh, always going to work better than another in terms of utility regulation. It's really, uh, you have to really look at the, the political and, and regulatory context in each state. Absolutely. And while we have you uh, here, I just one other question from Nancy. Um, she asked to explain the term stretch code versus reach codes. Um, if you can just touch on that quickly. Yeah, I, I view them as, as similar. Uh, you know, the idea is that you have a baseline uh, state energy efficiency code, and then cities have the option of going beyond that uh, in, in many states, at least in some states cities are still preempted. So whether you call it stretch or reach, the idea is, you're, is the city is adopting a code that goes beyond the minimum uh, required by the state. Um, and I have a quick question for um, John and Michael, because um, you mentioned several congressional recommendations throughout the report. And given that we're now looking at a uh, the bipartisan Congress and how some of them might be very challenging. Is there any selection of some low hanging fruit that you think are still feasible to propose and push forward in this environment? Um, I'll, I'll start. I think that research and development in advanced energy technologies and carbon capture and sequestration and direct air capture, I think has bipartisan support. And that's one thing that may well go forward. The um, Lisa Murkowski, the senator from Alaska, has been doing some interesting things on energy efficiency, and uh, I think there may be an opportunity for that as well. She and Senator Manchin have been promoting a, a, a bill together that may, that may move. Thank you. Um, and Rita had one other question. This is a very technical question, so anyone jump in if you have an opinion, but we're um, hydrogen powered buses versus electric buses. I, I think hydrogen technology is, is still a little nascent um, and, and it would require a special kind of infra infra infrastructure to do it. I think in the long term, there's tremendous potential for hydrogen, not only for buses, but for long distance freight. Hydrogen has been identified probably as the most promising technology for long haul trucking, for example, but the technology I think still has a ways to go before it's fully applied. And I agree with that. And we'll just say there are there are uh, on the market and in use today, heavy duty electric trucks, heavy duty uh, electric school buses. So it makes sense to um, use the technology that we have today while looking at hydrogen, hydrogen as a potentially helpful technology down the road as we get into that last stretch of, of decarbonization. Absolutely. Uh, Wes, I see your, your comment in here. I just want to make sure to um, uh, comment on it. Uh, you, you asked about educating you know, the general public and really the mo motivation behind this report and why we should implement this and why it's so important. Um, while we don't directly address that in the report, we're trying to do that through our network and through SDSN USA that works with universities across the country to localize these recommendations and identify solutions that can be fostered at universities or with community collaboration. Um, but your point is very well heard and it is not necessarily a, a key part of our report necessarily. Our, our audience was really a congressional and, and executive administration. Um, we have one minute left. So any final remarks before we uh, close out? Well, well, I'll just say that it's very 
energizing, if I can use that word, that we are on the cusp of a new administration that actually wants to move forward. And I think that there's a lot of enthusiasm around the country among people who want to have a clean energy economy and want to fight climate change for to, to uh, see this new administration come into power. And we're already seeing a, a great deal of defense action. Well said, and cities and states will continue to lead as well. And as the climate changes, the impetus for this is only going to grow. Um, and what you've seen with the measures that have been adopted over the last several decades is that you can reduce greenhouse gas emissions, build the economy, create jobs, uh, protect communities, uh, foster the development of new technology and protect low income people and businesses all at the same time. And as more and more people see that and experience that, um, I think the, the, the momentum for continued action on um, reducing greenhouse gas emissions is only going to grow. Thank you, John. Well said, that's many of the key messages from across the report, um, great highlight. And so that very, uh, uh, to finalize here, just mentioning if you'd like to dig into a few more of these sector chapters, uh, we do have three more additional ZCAP webinars coming up over the next two weeks on our materials group, our industry group focusing on cement and steel decarbonization, and our food and land use group. So some of those recommendations that they covered on the agriculture side, uh, really digging into the solutions there. Um, so thank you, Kit, Michael, and John for participating today. Really appreciate it all of your remarks um, and everyone please go visit our website and download the report thank you thank you